Everyone said, how did you do it? I said, I did everything I could do. It didn't matter if I won or lost at that point, because in my mind, I was successful. I now realize there's another level of intensity to training that I can do day in and day out, but at that time, I felt like I was all in. So I finished that year, and I thought, you know what? I'm going to try professional tennis. I had a couple friends who said, there's these leagues over in Europe that you can play, club tennis, you get, you get a little bit of money, there's these money here, I didn't really understand it. We had to go move to France, I was like, all right, well, why not, right? You got one chance to live, let's go do it. Everyone said, you know, can you make it? And I said, I don't know if I can make it, but I'm going to go and try to be the best tennis player that I can be, and when I reach my potential, then I'll pack up my bags and come home. Might be six months, might be a year, who knows? But I'm going to give it the best I got. So I went there, I started working, and the first years were tough. I mean, we were, I mean, living on very little money. Week to week, win $100 here, pay for the train ticket to the next tournament. I mean, sleeping in our car, sleeping in the park, begging the tennis club, can we sleep on that couch in the corner because it looks really nice, and it's better than the bench in the park that I saw on the way in. Like, please. So when, I, when, I, when I finally passed that level and got to the next level, it was like, wow, the challenger level, like, this is awesome. I mean, they give us a free hotel. Like, players were paying us on the tour, but that was rough. And I was like, man, this is, this is awesome. So, as I started progressing, everyone said, you know, can you make it? You know, and I, and I always resisted. I said, I don't know. I'm, I'm going to try to be the best tennis player that I could be. And if that, if that was my goal, I could be successful. I was successful when I got my first ATP one. I was ranked 1,483 in the world. Because <laughs> that was the best that I had ever been in. There was a Division three players doing that. And that was a success. And I felt good about that. Whereas other guys around the tour looking grumpy because they felt like they weren't achieving their goals, which was to make it. Um, don't set goals that are so high that are somewhat out of your control. Do these little ones along the way, stuff that you can do. So I kept fighting, improving, improving, continuously with the goal of hitting every ball with a purpose. I'm going to improve every day I walk on the court, whether it's an unheated club in France where you know no one's watching, or whether I'm warming up Roger Federer at the US Open. My nerves might be different, but my focus is always the same. Every time I walk on the court, I'm trying to improve. I'm trying to get better. As the question really became, hey, when are you going to make it? Or, you know, have you made it? There's a lot of different, different de definitions to that. For me, one big step in making it was when I walked on court at the Australian Open. And, and the same court that I would watched five years earlier as a fan and told my friends, it's impossible to actually walk on this court and play. That was making it. For a lot of people always ask me, oh, you're a professional player. Do you play Wimbledon? And so now, once I play Wimbledon, I was like, yeah, I did. I played it six times. It's a good tournament. I, I really enjoy it. Um, <laughs> that, that, that was making it in a lot of people's eyes. Um, my first welcome to the big leagues moment was in 2006. I get to play a Grand Slam. I just missed out on making the U.S. Open, but I played a couple of ATP level tournaments, and my third one was in the fall in Basel, Switzerland. And I don't know, some of you know that's like Roger Federer's hometown tournament. He's from just just near Basel. And, I called my coach from Minnesota and said, you got to come with me. Like, we, I'm going to play the tournament, and Federer's in the tournament. But you got to come. Like, this is going to be awesome. We're going to see Federer play. And he's like, all right, I'm going to get it. going to be great. I, I lost in the second round. We missed his first round match because I had to practice or do something career-related. Uh, so the second round match against David Ferrer. Uh, we're going to have a nice dinner in the players' lounge. Then we're going to sit down and we're going to watch Rosner. It was so fun. We went out to watch the match, and every seat was full. Like, 5,000 seat arena, and there was, like, literally wasn't a chair to sit on. I asked the usher, like, can we just stand here? And he said, no, no you can't. He said, try, try down in the boxes in the front. Maybe there's some no-shows in the, the luxury boxes. So I went down front, asked the woman, she goes, yeah, we have, we have two seats. You know, next changeover, you can go on this one box. There's two, two of these seats. It's great. Got put next to this woman who's, like, had more questions than anyone I've ever dealt with. You know, oh, you're a tennis player. Where are you from? What racket do you use? You know, you know what's your ranking? You know, it's just like... All right, well, i got to be polite. It's her box. You know, and answered all the questions. And a few games go by, and finally I said, all right, I better ask her, you know, who she is or what her questions are. Or what, what's, you know, I said, so what's, are you guys a sponsor of the tournament? You know, what's, up, what's the deal with this box? And she goes, oh, no, Ron, uh, this is actually a personal box. And I was like, personal box? What do you mean? Goes, yeah, I'm Roger's mother. And this is probably <laughs> Spot. <laughs> and so 
So the match went on. We're going to go play the cheering for Roger and try not to embarrass ourselves. Um, at the end of the match, we think, okay, God, we got through it. Say, you know, no problems. And Roger starts speaking in, and in Bosley, speaking in Swiss German, so we don't understand what he's saying, but we're applauding with everyone, you know, applauding how great he is. And we think we're out of, the, out of the woods, and all of a sudden the spotlight comes on our box, and Roger decides to introduce his mother and his father to the crowd, and like, oh, he's under the, the table. And it's just like, for me, that was my welcome to the tour moment. I mean, since then, I've had to become friends with Roger, and, you know, we, we joke about it, and he gives me a hard time for when I'm going to come sit in this box again. But at that time, I was like, you know what? I'm not beating Roger, but I'm in the same tournament. I'm in the Willow Pro Tennis. So for me, for me, that was making it. If you guys can walk out here with three things of anything that I've said today, number one, make friends. When you guys look to go into these different schools, meet the coach, meet the players on the program. They're very likely going to be some of the closest friends you have. I got married last fall, and I had 14 college teammates fly to my wedding across the country. My wife played tennis at Dartmouth. She had 12 friends come in. They're some of the closest friends that we have are our college teammates. And make friends with your opponents. The guy who beat me in the NCAA final picked my wedding. The tennis world is really small. Once these work, these, these, you know, being part of a team is really special, but the team ends after four years. Make friends with your opponents. Just because you go to Harvard doesn't mean you have to hate Yale. I love it, although now I understand this hatred is really deep. This is hard. I've never understood this implied from the East Coast. Um, but make friends. There, there's a rule in French money tournaments that the winner of every match has to buy a loser a drink. And back then, I had no money. We were so poor. But my friends said, you have to scrape together four euros and buy the guy a coffee or a poker or a beer or whatever he wants and sit down and have a chat. It's an unwritten rule, but everyone still does it. That doesn't have to be true here, but that principle can be carried on. My dad, when I was growing up, said, whenever you beat someone, you know, in these local matches, when you win 6 6 Eric, you've got to go and talk to your opponent. You've got to compliment them on something. Four years later, I went to college, and we started playing these matches within our conference where we win quite easily. And our coach said, all right, the Gustavus rule is when you shake hands with your opponent, you have to compliment them on something in your game. And in their game, have a oh, yeah, that's pretty nice. Yeah. But this helped me build relationships with some of my opponents that it's, it's really uncommon, it's hard to do in tennis, but trust me, it will pay off in the long run. Number two, challenge yourself. This focus that I talked about, it's a level of professionalism. I practice probably two hours a day. You likely practice two hours a day. But from the first ball that I hit until the last ball, I am very focused mentally and physically. That's something that you can start today when you're out any balls. You can start it tomorrow when you're with your coach. Try to get better with every single practice. Over the long run, you will make huge strides. Take that focus into everything you do, into your schoolwork, into your work. Try to get a lot out of every, everything you do. My wife, when she first met me, used to give me a hard time because I'd come home from a long day of practice and I'd sit on the couch and I'd just shut down. She said, you don't have anything to say? I'd be like, oh, I'm sorry, I'm, just, I'm so tired. She's like, yeah, but mentally you should be, you're physically tired, but you should, you're, you, mentally you should be fine. I said, no, like, I'm actually mentally drained. Like, that last three hours was the really focused focus time for me. I was working on my game. I was thinking about my shots. How can I improve? Take that and apply it to everything. Finally, take every opportunity that you get. When a door opens, jump through it. You never know what's going to come. When my second year on the tour, one of my doubles colleagues nominated me for a thing called the HG Player Council. I didn't really know what it was. Explain to me it's this 10 man board that represents the tour. He says, I think you'd be really good for it. I was like, why? I'm like 26. I don't even know anything about protests. I said, you know, to be honest, you're one of the few guys that know with a college degree. I said, okay, I'll, you know, I'll rock. I ended up winning the day where there was a bunch of guys around. I got elected. Now I'm serving my third term on the player council. This last year I got named the vice president. So when we go to Shanghai, I have to spend three hours Friday, Saturday, and Sunday night strategizing with the president about how we're going to handle the Grand Slam negotiations. <laughs> president of the Third Council is Robert Federer. And here we are making some of the biggest decisions that are going to affect pro tennis. You know, the greatest player of all time and a lowly recruited division three tennis player. You never know what's going to happen.